on city scale energy consumption and charging simulation model for electric buses in Singapore. So today's outline for the talk will be first, I will square a bit of the motivation why I'm looking at this and what are the, the challenges I'm trying to address with this uh, work. Then uh, I will describe how a city scale simulation model for electric buses has been built. And I will share some preliminary results and insights, which hints at, uh, at first findings. And then I would conclude um, the talk. So first, uh, why electric buses and why is it a topic of interest is for me. The reason is, um, as you know, we are moving into a world where uh, mobility will be electrified. It will be uh, cars. And this is what is the bulk of the, of the mobility that is talked today. But electric buses are also quite important in terms of mileage in cities. They represent a, a fair share of, of the energy consumption. And it is uh, forecasted that they will be deployed much faster than electric cars in terms of, of uh, percentage of total fleet. Uh, by 2030, we expect basically most of the global sales in the world to be electric buses. And by 8040, uh, it will be probably uh, the fleets which are already to 80% uh, electric according to Bloomberg. So in Singapore, we already see the beginning of this. Uh, 60 electric buses have, been, have, start, have started being deployed this year, and you might have already seen some of them uh, in, on the streets since uh, the few last months. In this context, uh, my question is, what are the requirements and the impact of electrifying public transit buses at city scale? With a specific focus for, for my case of the impact on terms, in terms of energy demand and charging demand. So uh, what is the impact on the electric grid and how much uh, chargers would be, for example, required for uh, electrifying the public buses. What are the challenges of this topic? Um, the first one is linked with the nature of transport networks. Um, it's, uh, as, as we said, network, which means we have the network effect where the infrastructure being shared and the, the bus routes being connected uh, at, at uh, similar locations, where when you decide installing, for example, chargers at one location, and another location will have an impact on the other locations. For example, if you see A, B, C, three end of bus lines, which form a triangle, if you put chargers at A and B, but not at C, it will give you a certain charging demand uh, and, and scheduling pattern. But if you decide not to install also at C, then it changes both at A and B the impact. This also means that it's not, um, we cannot just simulate individual bus lines one by one, calculate the results, uh, and then aggregate everything and get your final results for the, city, for the city. If you ignore some part of the city, you ignore some effect that this part that you're ignoring uh, will have on your uh, simulation. Secondly, um, I want to focus on the fact that real world situations are quite heterogeneous, and it's usually not very useful to just represent something with the average and then extrapolate on it only. What I mean by that is if I tell you, for example, bus line X uh, requires an average of 55 kilowatt, kilowatt hour per trip. Um, and we plot over the time of the day on our X axis, the energy demand on the, on the Y axis, you would expect something close to, to this line, for example. But if we actually calculate it, um, you can see that the energy demand for each trip, which is all of, all of the single red dots can vary significantly above or under. You see peak hours, you see off-peak hours, and even for a given hour, you have a, a wide variations. So when you plan for the future, you need to know what is the worst case, what your expected case, and what is the best case. And focusing on simulations or, or methods that allows you to have this kind of uh, vision into the distribution of your values is much more helpful than a single value. So now to the motivation of, of my work is to build uh, and study the impact of a public road transport electrification at, at city scale, where I take into account as much as possible of the constraint and network effects that happen in real life. Um, let's review what are the usual uh, approaches that we can see in literature first. Um, many studies, uh, when they look at the full network of a city, they simply use average energy demand per unit of distance or per unit of time, and then there's extrapolate by multiplying by the distance of bus routes, for example, or they rely on using a standard driving cycle taken from literature, or for the lucky ones, they have measurements of driving profile, very high resolution, and then they use this as basis to calculate the energy demand. However, uh, for the two first one, you have the advantage that it's easy to scale, but for 
the drawbacks is that you cannot really take into account the local characteristics of a bus route and we will see that it's important and the results are not so detailed in the end. Whereas the last one gives you the best results, the most detailed, the most local characteristics are uh, accounted for, but it's time consuming to process this and it can be hard to gather this, um, this data and to scale it up then to a full city. So before I went into the current model that I will be presenting, uh, I want to mention that we initially started from another first simple model to, to get the ball rolling, I would say, trying to get the energy demand from the buses in Singapore using existing real world data. So we use basically this tap, uh, the, the easy link data, uh, tap in and tap out when, when, you, when you board the bus. Uh, you can basically use this data to know that at this time, this bus was at this bus stop. And then you can basically uh, derive approximately where the bus were over the, 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 the duration of their journey. And from this, using a simplified driving profile, we can calculate or estimate this energy demand for each vehicle. And this is how I get to um, the graph that I showed you earlier. And that also shows that for different bus line, you can see here there is different energy demand characteristics. However, uh, while this approach has uh, the advantage of being covering the whole city immediately and um, take into account the real world bus operation, traffic congestion and, and things like that, um, the, most, the main limitation is because it's historical data, which uh, is based on these diesel trips, uh, these diesel bus trips, it's impossible to change the trips for future scenarios if we want to investigate different scenarios. And the trip schedule of, of the existing buses, like the diesel buses, is not constrained by the range of electric buses. So it might not be feasible for an electric bus to actually do the trips that are seen today. And also more importantly, we don't have information about off-service trips, which also consume energy. So this is why we needed to have a flexible simulation platform to investigate uh, future scenarios with high details. And thus we have been using and building upon CityMOS. Um, CityMOS is a mobility simulation platform, microscopic agent-based uh, mobility simulator that can scale up to the, the, the whole city, um, high performance. So you can get results of many days of simulations uh, only in a few hours of, of, of calculations and very flexible in terms of implementation because you can add and uh, fine tune your models uh, as you wish inside for different agent types. In my case, uh, today I will focus specifically on the bus simulation where I model all bus services of Singapore, where I do a detailed modeling of vehicle and charging infrastructure. And I simulate it over many days of operation to, to look at what is energy demand for uh, the whole system. Since the model is agent-based, um, it goes down up to each individual vehicle that drives on the road. Um, each bus can have its own battery and power train, so we are tracking the state of charge and the energy consumption for each individual vehicle uh, separately. So if a vehicle drives on, on one bus route or another bus route, they would have different energy consumption. Um, with different passenger inside, it will also have different mass and so on and so forth. Um, the aircon can be taken into account based on, on various factors. And in the end, um, we get to the energy demand. We, as I said, incorporate all the bus lines of Singapore based on the real bus lines that happens that are existing today. Um, and we take the schedules from uh, the existing open data from LTA data model. Then after the bus drives um, and get depleted, for his battery, we do the charging. So for this, we can investigate different type of charging end station where the bus would, for example, top up energy after a trip at the interchange, so at the terminus where the, the bus ended. Or we can also go to the other direction, which is doing depot charging where buses would drive as they usually do, but when once they are not enough energy anymore, they would drive back to depot to recharge. We can investigate different um, type of scheduling, waiting queue strategies, and we also take into account characteristics that are important to, to account for. For example, when the battery is almost full, usually the charging power needs to be reduced to avoid the battery being damaged. And this has an impact on planning because um, the last few percent of the battery needs much more time to recharge than the first uh, part of the, of the battery. So this can be also included. And in the end, as I mentioned, uh, my goal is to look at the impact and whether this has a significant impact on the electric grid. So uh, from the charging that just uh, was described in the previous slide, 
we derive the charging core at each location, so each terminus or each depot. And these charging curves are high resolution and can be used in a grid study, for example, that uh, some of my colleagues also do. I have a video on online, uh, which is quite long, so I won't show it here uh, during the presentation, but you can look on YouTube and later at the end of the presentation, you can also go through my, my website to, to see it. It's a video that basically sh shows an overview of how the buses uh, drive and recharge in, in city malls. So coming to the uh, scenarios that I will show you later in terms of, of results, um, as you can see, you can, with, with such a model, uh, high fidelity and microscopic simulation, there is a lot of knobs you can turn, uh, parameters you can change to suit your scenario. So we can decide what the bus model is. Every parameter of the bus is configurable. Um, the battery can be changed, the battery size can be changed. Uh, what you want to do in terms of charging strategy can be also implemented and, and tested. The charging port of the, of the, of the chargers is also, uh, of course, configurable. You can define where you put your chargers, uh, where, um, the, the schedule of the buses can be also changed if you need to. And most importantly, we can simulate a range of electrification goals. Uh, we can look at the far futures and the present, or we can look a bit closer. And this is what we will do later in the results. And also, as I mentioned earlier, we can have different charging uh, queuing priority systems uh, to come here. What we want to, to get out of the, out of the results, which I will show you just after this slide, is um, answers to questions like, what is the energy demand of, of buses for, for, for different bus lines? How many charger would be sufficient to operate the whole system for a given scenario? What charging strategies um, works or doesn't work or which one has the best uh, uh, impact? And also more generally um, for planning, if there is some bus lines which are more challenging, you can then identify them through this uh, model. So now the rest of the presentation will be about showing some preliminary results and an insight we gain already from, from this model. So first, um, I will describe a little bit about the energy demand um, and, and what we learned from it. And focusing first on the specific energy demand, uh, which is usually the value you, we use to compare with other um, reports and, and simulation, which is basically the energy demand per kilometer here. So very simply, you could just say, out of the simulation, we have uh, single decker buses in blue have uh, approximately 1.9 kilowatt hour per kilometer energy demand, and the double decker about 2.6. But this representation is not very representative for every bus routes in practice, as I mentioned earlier. The real life is much more spread over a, a distribution of values. So through the high resolution simulation, we can really get down to the detail and could decompose these values in two different uh, uh, dimensions. The first one is what is the distributional values that we have? So for different bus trips, we have different energy demands. Some bus routes are less energy consuming than other ones, and you can see it here for the distribution. You can also decompose differently your results, and this can be done with every result, but I'm doing it here only for this one in today's presentation. Um, you can here, for example, plot um, the energy demand per trip length so on this graph on the x-axis, this is uh, the, the length of the trip. On the y-axis, this is the specific energy demand in kilowatt hour per kilometer driven. Green is a double-decker service buses. Blue is a single-decker uh, service buses. And yellow and red are off-service buses, which since they don't stop at bus stops and since they are uh, without passenger, consume much less energy. But here you can see, and this is the outcome that I want you to show from this graph, is that even for a given trip length, you have a wide variation of the energy demand that can happen uh, in practice. And so if you are planning that this trip for this bus line, which you know is maybe 20 kilometer, will take, um, I don't know, 40 kilowatt hour, you might be wrong by a, a significant percentage factor. And if you don't take that into account in your planning, uh, this could be dangerous for your operation. You can also see through the simulation, we can vary the investigate the energy demand variation over time. So here, this is the same, but with the, the energy consumption plotted over the time of 24 hour. And you can see that there is a variation of the, uh, the energy demand for the time of the day. And it can be explained through peak and off peak hour where you have more passengers, so more mass in the vehicle, which also requires more air conditioning when there is more passenger. And finally, during the day versus during the night, um, you have the sun which shines and, and heats the vehicle and also uh, 
leads to higher air conditioning demands. All of this can be modeled and, and can be accounted for, accounted for in the simulation. Now let's move to something a bit more concrete, which is the absolute energy demand for per trip. And we will look at the cumulative distribution of the absolute energy demand. So this graph shows again that uh, we have a wide range of energy demand for different trips, which is mostly because there is a wide range of length for different trips. But you can see that um, you, can, you can get different uh, outcomes from different threshold you would set. Let's say, let's say you want to electrify 80% of, of the trips uh, of buses, so 80% uh, of, of the bus lines. You could say that um, you would be able to do it with a given maximum energy demand per trip. Whereas the last 20% are much harder to electrify. You can see that the values increase much faster. So here um, it's the number for 80%, uh, 47 kilowatt hour for a single decker bus and 65 kilowatt hour for double decker bus. To make this a little bit more intuitive um, in terms of impact on planning, um, if you uh, take a very fast charger at interchanges of uh, at 450 kilowatt, this would mean that you could technically compensate this energy spent during the trip within six minutes or nine minutes at most for 80%. But of course, it doesn't mean that every trips inside this in, in under 80% needs that much. For example, if you are here at 40, here at 40%, the energy demand is about half, so the charging time is also half. But again, um, looking at all of this, you can set different thresholds and different parameters to decide on your planning. Now, in the next uh, few slides, I will show results which will compare both two different charging strategies, opportunity charging and depot charging and different scenarios. So here I'm introducing the scenarios before I'm showing the results. So for opportunity charging, so this is a charging at end station. Um, for both scenarios, we will have all the trunk and feeder lines of Singapore. Um, the charging power for the bus chargers will be set to 450 kilowatt at 10 minutes, so ultra fast charging, and just a normal fast charging charger at depot for topping up at the end of the day. Um, most of the charging will be done or is done in during the layover time between trips when the bus are at the end stations, but they also can top up when they go back to, to, the, to the bus depot. Um, the charging queue and trip uh, for a very simple example today, uh, it's a first in first out um, queue. And the characteristic of the bus, uh, we, we use a single and a double decker bus with a battery of 150, 150 and 200 kilowatt hour respectively. Now comparing to depot charging, we just changed the charging power of, of, the, of, the, of the charger. So it's, it's a fast charger, but not as fast as the, uh, the one in Termini for depots. And there is no charging at all in Termini. And um, the battery size is increased to 320 kilowatt hour and 400 kilowatt hour so that the bus can operate several trips before having to, to recharge. So this is for the difference between the opportunity and depot charging that you will see in the results. Now the last dimension that will be shown in the results is, as I mentioned before, different level of electrification, percentage of the bus fleet that is electrified. And here on this slide, I introduce a notation that you will, you know, that you will see in, in the rest of, this, of the results, where I did a variation of the number of bus lines you would electrify. So this is this BLEL um, on the x-axis that you will see in the rest of the, of the presentation, where I say, for example, 30% of bus lines electrified to 100% of bus lines electrified this corresponds not equally to the same number of uh, bus uh, fleet because the way it has been done in this specific example, but it's just a choice and can be changed if we want, is to electrify the bus lines with the lowest energy demand first, so mostly the shortest bus line. And of course, because you do that, you need for the first 30% of bus line less buses in comparison than for the last 30% of bus lines. But here, um, this box will be uh, available in the next slide as a reference. Most importantly, just to see that we have the extreme from start of electrifying with 10% of buses electrified to full electrification at 100%, which we have simulated. Okay, so now to the results. Uh, what does the charging core look like if you sum it up over all the charging stations uh, in Singapore? And first for opportunity uh, charging at end station. So it would look like this. Um, with a shape which is very similar to the number of buses actually driving on the road. Since buses tend to just recharge at the end uh, of their trip, the charging demand is highly correlated with the actual driving demand. 
And you can see here that uh, for the worst case, so the 100% scenario, the charging power uh, peak is around 145 megawatt. So now the question is, is it significant? Is it uh, impactful on the grid in Singapore? To put this in perspective, we can compare it to the current Singapore power peak, so the maximum uh, electric demand uh, over a day, and it's approximately 2% of the current peak. If we look at the generation capacity, so how much the, the Singapore, in Singapore there is power plants and, and solar panels provide electricity, um, this is only 1.2% of the generation capacity. So the conclusion here would be that it's not negligible, but it's also not something that would collapse Singapore if we tomorrow, for example, switch di directly to 100% of electric prices. Of course, it will take more time, but we know already on the long term, this is something that is definitely manageable. The fluctuations, however, over short term uh, can be quite, quite uh, big. And this is also a research area to see whether this can uh, have an impact on the, on the results. Now, comparing this charging power that I show you for opportunity charging to a depot charging scenario. So here, this is the same graph as before, except that we have five days uh, instead of one day, just because it's easier to compare with depot charging and to see that the difference. So the difference mostly is that the charging happens later and more overnight, but also during the day with a shift basically, because at the beginning of the day, when the bus start operating, they've all been recharged fully more or less. And thus they don't need to recharge until they have done enough trips so that their battery is empty or, or, or low enough. And then they start charging. And then you have a rotation of bus charging at depot during the day and driving on, on the road. The fluctuations also are much slower, much smaller because the chargers are not that big. So um, one bus charging or not charging, it doesn't make such a difference. Looking at the number of chargers you would need to, to put, I have provided here for depot charging, since we are speaking about depot charging in the last slide, um, where the depots are in Singapore. And here for different levels of electrification, again, then you can see the concentric circle showing the increase in required number of chargers to, to support the whole uh, system. So here we can see that for, for a large depots, we are in the, in the range of 100 to 175 chargers with some smaller um, depots, which require a bit less. Now comparing to opportunity charging, so where we distribute the chargers more in, this, in Singapore because they would be, for example, located at Termini, um, not that the scale has changed. So here uh, it was uh, 50 to 175, but to be able to show the circles I needed to, to increase the scale here to zoom in, so to say. And here you can see that uh, for the, the biggest termini, you have like about 25 to 30 uh, chargers. In the worst case, and again, the, the ultra cycle circle is only the 100% um, scenario. Looking now at um, how much energy, so we're looking at, we have looked at the power, now we look at the energy, how much energy they would consume for the whole fleet, for the two scenarios. Um, the numbers are, are similar, but a little bit different. So you can see that you do consume a little bit more here, um, about 2000 megawatt hour for depot charging versus um, opportunity charging. Reason being that for depot charging, the bus have bigger batteries, so they weight more. They need to do some more off-service trips to reach other depots. So all of this consume a little bit more energy. And when you aggregate everything over time, it, it, it sums, sums up to the difference. To put into perspective, what would it mean, again, for the worst case scenario, like the 100% electrification, this represents around 2 gigawatt hour of, um, of energy. And to compare this to the current Singapore electricity consumption daily, it's about 1.5%. So we are in the same ballpark as the power. It, it would be not negligible, but also not something that would create a really high load on the system. Now, this is all high level Singapore aggregate. Now, let's zoom down a little bit lower to the implementation and how, uh, whether the, the electrification has a significant impact at the location where the bus needs to charge. And for this, we look at the maximum installed charging power over the charging stations we, have in, we would have in Singapore. And again, comparing depot charging versus um, opportunity charging at end station, we can see, um, uh, of course, that the more you you, you electrify, the, the more energy you power you we need we, we need to install at, at uh, the worst case uh, charging station. And when you look at the scale here uh, in terms of uh, megawatt, uh, it would be like 24 megawatt in the worst case for 
100% amplification when we only do depots is because there is all of these charges concentrated in depots. Whereas for body charging, you spread it out a little bit more over Singapore, so you can see that the maximum value is only 11 um, megawatt. But in both cases, and even for the lower uh, present, uh, the lower activation goals, um, we can see that the, the power required would be a bit high compared to what is currently used and installed at a typical depot or a typical uh, uh, terminus. Currently, they only need power for the lights, for the displays, for the informatic, the IT systems, and for the machines they use for maintenance, for example. But all of this summing it up doesn't go up to megawatts of power they actually require. So if you want to install chargers uh, and certain number of chargers, you might have to upgrade a little bit the, um, the grid infrastructure, having a new transformer or a new uh, substation maybe to, to provide it. But it, it's something that anyway has to be done because of the concentration inherent to um, to buses. And uh, finally, last result I will show you today, um, also to, to put the focus more onto the point of view of a bus operator. Um, what they are usually uh, asking us when we are uh, working on this is how long will the bus need to charge and whether they can fit that in their schedule for the buses. So here, if you compare again this uh, charging and aid station versus depot charging, we can see that um, here on this graph, you have the time of the day on the x-axis and the charging duration in minutes on the y-axis. And here you see basically the distribution of charging um, duration for a given hour for all the buses in the simulation. And we, what we can see is that mostly we're below, let's say, 11, 10 minutes, around nine minutes on average, um, except at night where the bus don't have to drive again so they can use more time to, to recharge, um, but otherwise, most of the time, they can just top up the energy they spent during the previous trip. And it takes, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, about uh, five to 10 minutes. And you now the question is, does it fit into the schedule of the bus operators? This is something we have to uh, engage with them to understand better uh, what are the constraints here. For depot charging is different because here the charging power is a bit lower. And you can see the scale of this graph is, is much different. We are speaking more in hours here, uh, one hour, two hour, three hour. and at the beginning of the day, um, they might recharge only a, a little bit of energy, but during the, the, the main of the day, the buses that drive back to depot, they will still need about uh, one to three hours to recharge. And at night, they don't have to drive anymore, so they can use a little bit more time to finish charging until the morning arrives and they depart. Now, to sum up what we learned from this comparison of depot versus NCSM charging, um, we have put numbers on some uh, insights we were expecting First, the depot charging uh, advantages is because of simple operation. It, basically, the bus, once it depot to depot, just drives the normal way on the bus lines and only go by, goes back to depot when it needs to recharge. It's an advantage. Um, and the fast chargers at depots, since they are not as fast as the one that we would install with Pantograph, for example, at the Termini, they might cost a little bit less. However, the drawbacks uh, are that you would need a larger batteries, which increases the cost and the mass of the the vehicle, which also increases the energy consumption, as we've seen a little bit, uh, more off service mileage to drive back to depot. And since you only do the charging at the, at the depots, you concentrate more chargers. And overall, if you sum the number of chargers, you need more chargers to support this kind of operation. For engine charge, charging, the advantages are that you have a smaller battery. Um, you can reuse the idle time, this layover time between two trips at terminus uh, usefully for charging. Um, you need less offset strips because you don't need to go back to the depot to recharge. And overall, you, you distribute more charge. The chargers are more distributed, but the number is lower because they are fast chargers, ultra fast chargers. However, these chargers might be more expensive. Um, one big question, which we haven't yet included, and uh, we are trying to engage with uh, the agencies, is to understand what are the constraints in terms of space in terminus. It might not be feasible to install all of the chargers that I've shown previously because of space limitations. Um, electric grid upgrade would be also more challenging to do in the terminus. And it's also changing the way bus drivers would need to operate the bus because no, they don't really have to care about the, uh, the, uh, the driving, but also about the charging. To conclude, um, the city scale simulation allows us to take more railroad characteristics into account because we can Im implement all these models in, in as much detail as we, as we want. We have investigated um, 
two end of a spectrum, depot charging and session charging. Of course, we could also say that we could have a mix in the future and we are trying already to define future scenarios where we do maybe mostly depot charging, which is currently what the bus operators are privileging, um, but maybe with some top up at some uh, stations which are fit for that. The results indicate that it's technically feasible. I mean, on a technical side, it's, it's doable. Um, the impact on the grid would be not negligible, but limited. And also a charging duration in the simulation leads to all buses which charge before the, the new day of operation. So it means that it's sustainable. However, there is some remaining challenges, as I mentioned, um, because we need to provide this high power, we need to, um, to expect localized upgrade of grid connection. Um, as I mentioned, the space limitation and energy challenges might be limiting for end station charging. And adapting the best schedules, which have been already optimized for current operation of diesel buses to operation with electric buses is something new for bus operators and it will take some time and, and, and work to, to, to go into the future, I would say. Um, thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward to your questions. If you have um, more questions after the meeting, after this presentation, you can also contact me at the email address or go to my website to see uh, the publication and also see the video that I was mentioning earlier. Thank you very much.